Hi, everyone, and welcome to Playtime Online. I'm Amna Siddiqui, the producer and moderator of this program. Today, we're joined by a group of educators at the forefront of experimenting with SimCity as a learning tool with students in and outside of the classroom. We'll be hearing their stories this hour as they reflect on students' skills built and connections made while engaged in video game play. We'll also be discussing how to make students' gameplay meaningful and measurable using tools like Glass Lab's online teacher community, SimCity EDU. For those who aren't familiar with Glass Lab, they're a nonprofit research and development effort working to transform formative assessment through digital games. Glass Lab is a collaboration between Institute of Play, the Entertainment Software Association, Electronic Arts, the Educational Testing Service, Pearson Center for Digital Data, Analytics, and Adaptive Learning, among others. I'd also like to note that this episode is part of the Summer in Making Connecting Initiative, a campaign dedicated to engaging hundreds and thousands of people creating things on the web with hardware and on paper. Summer of Making and Connecting is organized by the MacArthur Foundation, Mozilla, the National Writing Project, among others. Now let's meet today's participants. Could everybody briefly introduce themselves and say a few words about your work with students in SimCity? Daryl, can we start with you? Yes, I'm Daryl Johnson. I'm a curriculum developer for the Digital Youth Network out of Chicago. We actually are part of a summer program with um, the city of Chicago, Chicago Summer of Learning. And as part of that, we created a badge. Bad, there's a badge system with Mozilla. And part of that is we created an urban planning badge in which students are actually playing SimCity. And they begin to level up from you know, a ward boss to an alderman to eventually being mayor, where they use the game, building a new Chicago of their own vision, their own world, so to speak. So they kind of take the game and they incorporate it into the world they already know. Thank you. Julie? I'm Julie Robinson. I'm the middle school tech coordinator at Oregon Episcopal School in Portland, Oregon. Um, and I've been using SimCity for the last three years in seventh grade science, um, using it to teach systems thinking, engineering design, and sustainability. Great. Uh, Patricia? My name is Patricia Moriarty, and I work with um, fifth and sixth graders with math and science in the classroom and the public school. And I've used SimCity for um, colonization. Um, to teach the 13 colonies and for math and science using um, the energy component. Wonderful. And Robert. Hi, I'm Robert Harris from the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, Illinois. Um, we started using SimCity just this past spring. We have three modules, a fall, winter, and spring module. In the spring module, our students did a study on energy, and also they led into a discussion on urban planning as well as uh, socioeconomics and how it relates to the crime rate, in, uh, especially with a lot of things that are going on in Chicago. And they turned that into curriculums and lesson plans. Thank you. Hi, Seth. I'm Seth Corrigan. I'm the Director of Education and Evaluation at Glass Lab. Um, and we're here working on uh, our first game, which is SimCity, uh, a, a version of SimCity. Um, also involved with the assessment aspects of that work, as well as the classroom uh, instructional design, too. Great. Thanks, everyone. And before we get started, I'd like to remind our viewers that at any point you'd like to ask today's speakers a question, just click on the blue participate text under this video on the right-hand side. We'll be spending the last 15 minutes or so of the webinar answering questions during our video <coughs> portion. So let's kick off today's conversation with uh, you, Seth. Um, I'm wondering why Glass Lab is so interested in using SimCity as a learning tool, and if you could talk about the advantages uh, uh, of using uh, uh, the advantages of, of, of Glass Lab uh, bringing video games like SimCity into educational settings. Well, you know, I, we have several motivations for doing this, but um, and I'll talk about a few. I, I think one of the most important ones is figuring out how to make students' environments more responsive to their needs. And an important part of that is focusing in on, on what kids are interested in doing, what engages them. And we think that bringing gameplay into the classroom is one way to, to help um, better meet that need for students. 
And then, of course, we're very serious about, about the instructional side and the assessment side of what we're doing. Um, and so we think that one of the things that, one of the advantages that gameplay brings by bringing it into the classroom is that where it's actually engaging kids, where it's interesting to kids, where they're motivated to participate, where, where we think we can increase the dosage or the, the amount of contact time kids have with the content. So that's one piece. The second is that there's this, this wonderful um, sort of natural connection between good design in games and good design in learning. Um, you know, if you think about, about uh, your favorite video game or, or other game, um, they're often paced for the player. So, you know, play starts out sort of introducing you how to play, what the, what the basics are. And then as kids play or as you play the game, you move on through increasingly sophisticated or complicated scenarios, learn more through the game. So we think there's some, some natural connections between game design and learning design that we can take advantage of there. Um, and then another piece which, which I'm, I'm very excited about is this idea of learning about how students learn through the games. And what I mean by that is that when we bring video games in the classroom, we're able to capture all kinds of information about students' actions within the game environment. And we can use those to start making inferences about what students know and how their ideas are changing during their experience. And that starts opening up um, all kinds of possibilities for us, both on the learning side and on the design side. So if you think about it, you know, learning design, um, if you look at the, I don't know, you know, the history of, of that, that world, it's still a lot of craft is involved. And so people spend a lot of their careers developing strong intuitions about how students learn, uh, what kinds of experiences support them best. And they turn those, in, those intuitions into design or features of the, of the learning experience for the student. And one of the things we think we can do is, is make some of those decisions, some of those design decisions, based on empirical evidence from what kids are actually doing within the games or within the learning experience. So imagine putting out an alpha a version of game, your game on month one, and by month six, for example, you've gotten all kinds of information back about how students learned during that experience where they weren't learning as quickly as you wanted to or which students weren't benefiting as much as, as others and feed that back into the design so you can improve the game so that by the next release you've got something that works even better for more students. Those are just some of the, some of the quick ideas and we can talk about um, others as well at this time. Thanks. So Seth, I'm also wondering if you could talk about some of the common fears or misnomers around video games as learning tools. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've been working um, with this idea of video games uh, over the last year, video games in the classroom. I've been working also with the idea of digital simulations for several years and bringing those in the classroom. And some of the comments I've, I've heard, um, yeah, I think the strong version of it is something like, you know, schools are serious places, and they are. Um, they're not a place for games. And so, you know, we've been doing this for for many years now, um, educating kids. We think we've got some patterns that seem to work for most of the people most of the time. It's, it's very onerous work. It takes a very serious attitude. Why are you introducing games into, into the mix? Um, and I, I, I agree with the sentiment behind that. I, I do think schools are very serious place, places. There's, there's a lot of serious work getting on, get going on there. Um, on the other hand, we know um, from a lot of the research that's been around for the last 20, 25 years, that kids often learn, um, learn best when they're playing. But that's a very natural way for kids to engage um, in new content and stretch uh, what they know. Um, that's one side of things. And the other side of things is we're dealing with, with whole people here um, that have emotions, have interests. Um, and it seems to me that it makes sense to sort of kind of craft what we're doing to engage them and, and um, hook them in to what we want them to learn. I think a second concern is that kids really can't learn through games. Um, there's just it, there's something about it that we just don't seem to connect. You know, learning serious topics with games, and and there the research is is starting to get even clearer. I think there's a pretty clear message already, um, uh, and we're getting more evidence back um, over the last year, year and a half or so that that's just not true. Kids are able to learn in games, and it's just like anything else. When games are well designed, they're learning more. When they're poorly designed, they're learning less. Um, so I think that's another another conversation that goes on too. And then the third one, 
which I think is a really important topic and, and something that would be fun to talk about here if there's time, is this idea of transfer. And that's the thought that, well, the game environment is a very specific environment. And are kids really going to be able to take what they learn in that environment and apply it somewhere new? I think that's one version of the question. And I think it's a genuine question and important. I think another version of the question is, we want kids to formalize their understanding in specific ways. So if a lawyer learns how to write a brief, for example, through a game, fine. But we better make sure the lawyer knows how to write that brief in a real world environment, too and can apply those skills where they really count. Um, so I, I think those are three, three concerns that, um, that have been brought up. Some of them not so um, sort of justified, others are. Does anybody want to add to that? Any thoughts? OK. Uh, Patricia and, and Julie, I'm wondering, as teachers, what do you think gameplay, video gameplay specifically, does for students that other teacher tools can't? Um, I can go ahead and take that one. Um, I think one of the things that it does is it's such an immersive environment that the student is really able to experience on a lot of levels uh, the game in a way that they can't when they are reading out of a textbook or even if they're in a discussion with a group of friends. Um, that's one of the things that I found with SimCity is that the students were aware of all the things that were going on in the game way more than they were when they were sort of abstractly talking about how a volcano works. I mean, they really were tuned into every aspect of the system. And why do you think that is? Why do you think they're, they're responding so well? Um, well, one of the big things that I've looked at is motivation. And I think the games hit on every component of motivation. They, students feel competent when they're playing. They're hit at right, the, right at the level that they're at, that it sort of adjusts how hard it is for them. Um, they're able to make their own choices about what they want to do. It's, then they're not having to listen to how they're supposed to grow their city. They get to choose a lot. Um, and there's a purpose or there's a meaning to it, um, and they see that. So. I agree with that. I think um, it also provides students with instant gratification. Mm -hmm. um, anytime they're engaged in a game, what I find is that the feedback coming back from the game brings them right to the next level of their learning. So there's like SimCity, for example. They build a certain city, and then when they're adding um, the energy to it, it automatically makes the city start thriving. And they, that, that instant gratification just motivates them to learn even more and more. And um, that's, that's why it makes an effective tool. It's something that a teacher, as, as much as we try to give them feedback on their work, it's not instant like it is in a game. And I, I, I want to pose this question to everyone. And that is, do you think educators today are more open to video games in classrooms uh, than ever before? I think they've always been um, open to video games in the classroom. I think that a lot of the national initiatives with standards and things like that have really tried to harness what teachers are doing in the classroom. But um, you know, after 20 years in the classroom, I remember 15 years back, we had a lot of more freedom to create and to develop our own curriculum. And now with the standards, as positive as that is, because there are certainly positives to having the standards, it's just um, I think many teachers feel constrained to the curriculum that they're given. I think we're getting there. I think we're getting to the point where video games have been around us. I'm looking at the faces of everybody here, I think everybody's played video games most of their life in some way, shape, or form. And then working here in the museum, the museum has even gotten to the point where we've accepted that video games are something that we at least need to try to figure out how do we adapt to it, how do we make, a, make it a part of the work that we do. Uh, so if the museums are at the point where we're considering archiving video games and trying to figure out how do we connect with students and we've realized that video games are how we do it, um, I think educators are coming around. Plus we have educators that are a lot younger now and they've been around video games and they probably had opportunities. I have friends that are gamers that have had conversations of how do we um, 
how would you bring this into a classroom? How could we use this more? And Sim City has pretty much been one of those first games that everybody knew that you could really do some major things and get kids engaged in this. I would add that I think um, teachers are human, and so they've had their own experiences, and sometimes they've never seen what a game can look like. Um, when I would talk about SimCity, teachers had no idea what it looked like. And when I showed them videos of it, they would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I could see how I could use this in my classroom. But it was until they actually saw the game that they were able to see the possibilities. But before that, it was just it was something they didn't know about. And games are based on a system of thinking, systems thinking. And as we begin to identify that, and build on that, we begin to look at them not only as games, but what is the sort of infrastructure under the game that can help the learning that we want to see with the students. So it's not just, okay, you're building a city, but what does that mean to build a city, and what does that look like, and cause and effect. If you do A, then B is going to happen. So it's always been educational, but I think now we look at games in a systematic sort of way where now educators can use them in the classroom without having to try to fight to defend them, but it's obvious in the actual play the role of the game and what it does. Great, thanks everyone. So I, I want to move on and I want to have everybody present their actual examples of using SimCity uh, with students. So um, Robert, let's start with you. Can you talk about uh, how MSI has been using SimCity uh, in its after school and summer programs? Hopefully, I'll be able to bring everything up. So what we did, and it's interesting that we're talking about this. Um, you know, when I first logged on, people were talking about the game kit. Can everybody see the urban planning discussion? Uh, nope. OK. Well, when we first started with SimCity, getting that going, we actually started off with just game design and what were, um, what were those things that make a game. And using the game kit that's on the Institute of Play's website, that's how we started with our teams. We got them to understand what actually is a game and what a game is. It's pretty much a set of rules, and within those set of rules, you should have fun. And you should learn those rules, and if you apply those principles to a learning situation, it's the exact same thing. There are rules, and with SimCity, one of the things that happened was we thought we first went into it, we wanted to talk about fuel, and we wanted to talk about energy. The teens actually went off in a completely different direction, and we just kind of let it happen. It was one of those things that I think when we talk about learning, we're actually talking about critical thinking skills and what are um, giving teens an opportunity to use their critical thinking skills. And this was the perfect opportunity. So what happened was the teens ended up having a conversation, and different lesson plans were developed by our teens that could be used in uh, different settings. Um, they did one on urban planning, where they talked about how do you design a city, like Daryl was talking about earlier. What are those things that go into planning a city? And a lot of our students didn't think about that. They also, the biggest one for me was um, um, socioeconomics and how it uh, relates to urban decay and how it relates to crime rates. And everything went back to a conversation on how important education is, how important it is to have the right education settings in any community. We had uh, students design cities where there was one side of town and there was another side of town and they cut off pretty much traffic or limited access from one community to the other. One community had great education systems. They had elementary school, middle school, high school, college. The other community didn't have anything other than elementary school and the conversation went to um, the crime rates that started to happen in the neighborhood that only had um, an elementary school and they actually have one person from that neighborhood that just had an elementary school go over into the better neighborhood and within a few seconds that person was arrested because you just didn't fit in and the kids started to discuss you know what are the reasons behind that and then it went to um, the fuel conversation and the energy conversation and one student set up a city where he had a nuclear plant uh, in the neighborhood and that community, but the education system only went up to high school. And the reactor imploded in the conversation was, that's because you need to have education. You need to have people that are trained. You need to have people that are knowledgeable to run a nuclear reactor. So we can talk about fuel as much as we want to, but everything is going to go back to education. And I think one of the things that really helped with SimCity and our students getting um, um, having this opportunity to write lesson plans, they realized how hard it is to be a teacher. They realized 
all the things that teachers had to do, you know, putting together questions, what are the objectives, what are the lesson plans, you know, filling out 50 minutes of time, an hour of time. And when we got done, one of our students came back in with a book because they told their teacher what they were doing, and the teacher gave them a book that they used in college on curriculum design. And so that student and that teacher ended up having a better relationship because the teacher kind of felt like, I think you're starting to understand what I'm doing. And we wouldn't have had that opportunity if it wasn't for Sim City. And I've been trying to get my information up on the screen share, but it just has not been happening. So my apologies on that. Oh, I, I see it. Is that it? Yep. Okay, it. good. All right, here we go. So on this one, this was the urban planning one. This is, and the students wanted to just go with a discussion. They really wanted to focus on how do you have that conversation? How do you spark talks? Oops, um, Robert, not to interrupt you. Do you mind making it a little bit bigger for our viewers? I will try my best. Give me one second. Does that work? Wonderful. Yes, exactly. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so this was just um, just talking about urban planning, and one of the things that came out for um, our students, they really, and I'll get to this bottom part just to speed this along, just the questions that they put together. And one of the things that they talked about was that with SimCity, you had a power to control a lot of different things. So you can put in a police department, you can take away different services, you can establish education, and then you can actually see, and what, one of the things that we talked about a little while ago was just that immediate feedback that you get from SimCity. And since it took me a while to get this up, I will go to, this was a five-week lesson plan that the students put together are based on socioeconomics and how it relates to crime and how cities can deteriorate. If you don't think about uh, certain factors in certain communities, one of the things that we deal with in Chicago's education system and um, some of the concerns that parents are having now because their students, their, their teens have to walk or go a little bit further and that affects a lot of different things that our students are dealing with. But um, our teens put together five lesson plans. The first one dealing with um, dealing with power, energy, and just establishing your city. The next one was really focused on the infrastructure of your cities, the in, um, providing roles and zoning and making sure that you have an industrial uh, part of town, making sure you see where schools are, and then having an understanding of how important parks are as well. They also wanted to take time and make sure that it was time to reflect, so they wanted to take that middle section of those five weeks and kind of just make quick notes of the observations in the journals about what's going on and what they've seen so far and continue with that following through and really just observe your cities and there's a video that I posted online on YouTube um, we did a presentation day here out in the rotunda with our students and I posted a video because they posted the, um, the cities that they had worked on and something happened during the presentation and the kids got really excited about it their cities became 100 percent efficient in, uh, as far as energy. Everybody was driving leaves, everybody was using wind energy, and the kids got really excited because that's something they were working on, and in the middle of presenting it to guests, it actually happened. Um, so that's what our students worked on, and sorry it took so long for me to get everything posted, and I will move on now. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was muted. <laughs> Whoops. Um, what was, I was saying was, Patricia, uh, let's move on to you. And uh, I'm wondering if you could talk about how you used uh, SimCity with your sixth and seventh or sixth grade math and science students. Well, I originally used um, SimCity, as I said before in my introduction, with fifth graders in social studies. And what at that time I taught social studies and I was doing a unit on the 13 colonies and what I connected was then now and tomorrow and the students were responsible for colonizing their own city on a planet that was the problem that was given to them um, and they used SimCity as a tool to do that and to develop their colony and they got to explore things like what they needed for energy what they needed for food, how much land, all these things came into play. And that's how I began recently as a sixth grade teacher in math and science, 
what I focused on is the energy component of SimCity and what kind of energy should we use to be able to have our cities thrive? Should we go with hydropower? Should we go with elect, um, electricity? Should we, what should we use for an energy source? So that's the different ways that I've used it in the classroom. Um, this year with the new SimCity coming out, my plans are is to start off with the start of the year to use it as a collaborative tool because the common core state standards often in those embedded is that students that students can persevere and communicate what they are learning um, in a in a in a classroom and so it brings in those presentation skills and collaboration students oftentimes I don't know um, if you have any experience with sixth graders, but oftentimes they, they have a difficult time getting along. And when you put them in a group of like three or four, um, you'll have one that you know plays off the other. But this is a great way to start off the year to create teams in this way. They're collaborating right away to continue on throughout the year in math and in science and all the things that um, I'd like to build with SimCity curriculum. Great, and I actually I have a question for you, Patricia. Um, does technology make your role as teacher any different? Hugely so. Um, technology has been at the forefront of, of what I've done um, starting 25 years ago in special education and working with students in special needs and, and right away they felt a connection with the software that I was using and, and it felt like they could learn and all the way to today using smart boards and so different software for students to learn. Um, it has broadened my ability to personalize and differentiate my instruction like no other tool that I've ever used. Great, thank you. Daryl, can you talk about the Chicago of Summer, Chicago Summer of Learning effort and how uh, Digital Youth Network is using SimCity to engage students? Yes. Well, now, the Chicago Summer of Learning is interesting in part because we're talking about student agency, meaning that the students or the young people have to choose to play the game. They are choosing. They want to badge up in urban planning, and they want to play and move themselves to a new level. So the idea was to come up with a structure or a curriculum that would allow them to do so easily but not get discouraged and stop playing before they get to the highest possible level. So there were a couple of things we decided to do in that vein. The first was to almost create a template from them so they could choose to, um, I'm trying to share the screen also, they could choose to and there we go. They could choose to pick a neighborhood. We came up with templates for um, 10 different neighborhoods. And the one I'm sharing with you, does everyone see the Chicago Loop? Yep. OK. So we did outlines for 10 different neighborhoods in the city. The Loop is our downtown area. And what we begin to do is identify to start off the difficulty level based on the amount of money and the amount of skill it would take to create it. Then we walk them through what it would look like to create a template of the downtown area, what streets they would need, how they would want to name them, and what that would look like. As we begin to walk them through, we literally identify what sort of density they would want to use. We would identify the cost of it for them. And I'm not going to do that, but we begin to identify the grids, the cost, and at the end, we remind them of little tips that we use. I'm scrolling quickly, but this will be posted where you can access it. Um, how they would go about doing it. This became important because when we stopped to look at students functioning on their own, and really you play games by yourself, but if you hit a road bump and you're not interested, you'll stop. The summer program is six to eight weeks, and we want kids to play in badge which means you have to hit certain levels. The second piece we had to be very clear about was to identify what it is that they are aiming for. With that, we were looking at almost a rubric setup. And with that, you would have three levels. 
Are you looking with me at the descriptors? Can everyone see that? War boss, alter person there? Yep. Okay, great. So we had to break down gameplay in such a way where they would know when they were badging and what that actually meant for them. And so we really built that off of um, future cities. We worked with them and we really built out a system that allowed for the young people to identify, listen, these are the sort of things I'm looking for to scale up and move to the next level of play. And can, you that, read, can you read what the document says? Uh, maybe just the, the, the three badge levels? and The ward boss, which is the introductory level, and it's built off of really how Chicago politics work. You would, might start off as a ward boss in your local area, moving on to being an alder person, which is you're responsible for a larger area of the city um, and you make up the city council and then of course the mayor where you're responsible for all of the city and that's based on specific um, the descriptors areas we were kind of them look at population budget mayor rating industry jobs city services energy coverage renewable energy waste removal pollution roads public transportation airport, crime and justice, education, recreation, and then the last piece is a city plan, which is that they stop and actually think about how they wanted to plan out their city to reach certain goals. And as you look through the rubric, you can discover to just be a ward boss, there's certain things that really are not on your radar. You might just want to play and say, listen, I built a neighborhood, it's cool. But if you want to scale up and you want to badge up, you have to have a broader vision of the city itself and what that means as you're building it out and how you're going to pay for it. And the kids are actually in the midst of playing right now. So we'll know in a couple of weeks um, how it begin to play out. But they're playing and they've just started. And it's interesting to watch them get excited about choosing specific neighborhoods and building them out and even trying to connect and move one neighborhood away to another neighborhood and all the gameplay that comes with that and figuring out how to get money in order to expand their neighborhoods or to build revenue sources. So it's really you're getting them to think and learn the skills we want them to think about and learn, but doing it in a way that they're choosing to play and scale up. Question and thoughts? I love the ideas of being a ward person or a ward boss and then an alder person and mayor. That's awesome. It's great language. Thank you. How did the students like working uh, uh, toward the badges, the different badge levels? Well, they're in the process of doing it right now. So clearly they like it. Part of the thing is with the instant gratification, the game automatically has a built in sort of system which is why it was really big for me to make sure we shared the rubric because on our end then we badge them and they get to put it in their um, Mozilla backpack and it's something they can carry around with them and so that process takes um, a second longer than the sort of instant gratification piece but what's great for the students and what's great about SimCity is you know you're going to badge once you get a screenshot saying that your city met the requirements. Once you meet the requirements, you're set so they can move on to the next level of play while they're waiting and the next morning they can wake up and the badge is already now loaded for them. So it's almost like an added bonus. And of course, because it's summer play, we have some outside um, incentive to, um, to encourage them to keep going also. Great. Thank you. So last but not least is Julie. Uh, Julie, can you talk about how you've used SimCity with, with your students to learn about systems thinking? Yeah, so um, like I said, so I'm, this is the third year that we've used SimCity in seventh grade science. Um, the year is systems and sustainability is the theme of the year um, for science class. Um, and just to give you a little context about my school, it's an independent school in Portland, Oregon. Um, and we have a one-to-one -one program, so the students are playing the game on their laptop, and we were at, we've actually been using SimCity 4, the older version, um, and so they're playing it on their laptop, and they're able to all um, play their own game and then also be playing it for homework and after school and carrying it around with them, basically. Um, 
so I'm going to share my screen here and give you uh, this poster. This is what I just presented at the ISTE, the International Society for Technology and Education conference um, that kind of describes the project. Um, we chose SimCity for both the content and the skills. Um, we were looking at city planning as a big thing in Portland, and it's a big part of sustainability, so the actual content of being a uh, civil engineer was important. Um, and then what I had said before about it being an immersive experience for students, um, I was finding that students were just kind of repeating back to me what I was telling them about systems thinking when I was talking about feedback loops, um, they were just kind of redrawing the things that I had drawn on the board and so I was really looking for a way for them to uh, kind of on a gut level understand what it meant to have all these subsystems and everything working together. Um, another part of choosing SimCity was also the data. Um, obviously in science you use a lot of graphs to make decisions and so uh, SimCity provides so much information for them to look through in order to make decisions about what they're going to do about it. Um, so our goals were systems thinking, engineering habits of mind, um, and then sustainability. So you can see the project here in the middle. Um, we did two weeks of play, so that's about nine 50-minute periods of really open-ended play. Um, I was really big on this because I wanted the students to be really comfortable with the interface before we actually did the project. Um, so they had two weeks of open-ended play, they used cheat codes, they destroyed their cities, they terraformed, did whatever they wanted. Um, they also did tutorials, there were uh, extension activities kind of around it. Um, we had uh, a video chat with a city planner um, we looked at the zone map for Portland, um, and I think that was really revealing for kids when they began to see Portland in the same light as this game. Um, we also looked at Kent Larson's TED Talk, and we listened to a radio lab about cities, and so I think those sort of accessory activities, again, made this really real and gave a context for using the game, even if the game was the central piece. Um, so when we went into the two weeks of work, or I guess purposeful play, where they were really focusing on growing one city, we gave them uh, a terrain to use, and that already had some cities grown up, and they took a, uh, a plot in the middle of that. And then they had to document the growth of their city. So you can see in the middle here, um, students were... Um, yeah, there it is, zooming in. Um, so they had to document their city and how things were changing over time and then what they were doing, how they were problem solving. Um, so they had growth photos. They also submitted pictures that showed the sustainability of their city. Um, and so the three dimensions of sustainability were environmental, economic, and social. And so things like um, economic sustainability would be a balanced budget. Social sustainability were schools and um, healthcare facilities, so they had to show what they were doing uh, for that. Um, and then they had different criteria that they had to meet. So for years in the future, they had played their city, what their population was, whether their budget was balanced, and their performance pools. So that was kind of the objective data that they were recording about their city. And uh, we're a Google app school, so they submitted all these screenshots um, in a uh, Google presentation that was shared with their teacher. Um, so that our city. A big part for me um, with the engineering habits of mine is having students articulate what they're doing, um, how they're making the decisions. One of the things that I really like about games is that kids are repeatedly asked to make decisions. Um, you know, if you've ever had a, shown up for a quiz and you, you think you understand it really well and then you go to write the answer and you realize you don't really understand it, um, that, would, that seemed to happen to my students. And so with a game, you're constantly having to make those decisions and I think that actually helps you understand it better. So um, we had students write down, you know, why did you make the decisions you made and that we were then able to see, kind of visualize what they were, um, how they were making those decisions. Um, 
So let me show you a couple examples. I think will this come in? Um, this was one uh, presentation that one of my students submitted. Um, you can see here she's just started terraforming. Is that coming through? Yeah. Um, and then they did a little write-up next to it. And then you can see she's just begun. She's zoning and building a few things. Um, and this was where they were able to write about it and also add in their explanation. Um, so here she's showing more detail of where, where people are living and what decisions she's making. Um, so in this case, she's talking about the social dimension of our city improving the health coverage. So that was an example of how we were trying to document what students were learning with, um, with using SimCity. So this one, this is a narrative that one of my students wrote. And this was, they did just one writing at the very end. Um, one of the things I think was interesting that the kids talked about a lot in here was that it was challenging, but they learned a lot. And so they were... Uh, beginning to realize that. Um, she talks about here that her health advisor told her something and so she raised taxes and then when she raised taxes then um, there were residents I think that moved out and then pollution so she's trying to balance all of these things to increase her population. Um, at the very end she talks about um, this project pushed you to think about every consequence for everything that you put into your city. Um, and that to me was like the epitome of what I wanted students to be doing was thinking about what they were doing. Um, if we get our seventh graders to think about the consequences of every action, I think we're doing pretty well. So, um, so yeah, so that, that, those are some examples of the project. Great, thanks, Julie. And I, I want to let our viewers know that uh, the resource that just that Julie just walked us through is available on the the page with the that's broadcasting the webinar. So if you just scroll to the bottom, you can um, download it and explore it and use it. So thanks for sharing, everyone. Um, we've just seen re four really fantastic, uh, compelling scenarios of, of video game learning. But what I'm wondering about now are are those schools resisting change? And uh, we're seeing pushback in some places. So I'm wondering, how do we get teachers and administrators to understand that, that video games aren't just a means of entertainment, but, but also can be keys to, to deep internalization of, of common core concepts? You know, working in Chicago Public High Schools for, um, for some years, one of the challenges that I saw was that there were teachers that did want to use video games. I think you're trying to meet students where they're at. You're trying to think of ways that you can engage students and use things that you know that they're interested in. But um, I think something that's been said earlier is that there are certain learning standards that administrators are just uh, tied to. There are things that they just can't do or they're not willing to know if they can take the chance. I know um, we, State of Illinois is signed on for the next generation learning standards. The Museum of Science and Industry is really working hard to at least get at least get schools um, ready for it and assist any way we can. Our research and evaluation department is working with some schools here to help them uh, get ready. And I think I'm excited about that because that's really focused on connected learning and the opportunity that video games provide in this uh, connected learning the experience that I just had with my students was that there were kids who were really good at SimCity and they got the opportunity to kind of be that leader on certain Saturdays. And we had one young man that when I said Uh oh, it looks said we're working with SimCity. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, can, can you um, go back maybe a couple of seconds? You were frozen for a little bit. Okay, sorry. But it, uh, just to sum it up, we just had, it's an opportunity for everybody to learn together. And I think that's where we're trying to go to with the uh, next generation learning standards. Not only is it an opportunity for students to show what they can do, but it's also for an opportunity that educators are going to be able to learn as well. They're going to be able to learn with their students. And that's the opportunity that video games are presenting right now. Great. Does anyone else want to say anything? Yeah, I think just with the teachers that I've worked with on this, um, it's 
there's an insecurity for them of not knowing the game really well. And so I try to coach them through, um, you know, giving them time to play and explore it, but also to say it's okay if you don't know. And in some ways it's better if you don't know all the answers because then the kids have to f actually figure them out for themselves. And that's not something that they're used to doing or that is um, comfortable, but it's, I think, important for them to acknowledge that they don't need all the answers. They really shouldn't have all the answers um, and that they the kids will teach them as well. And as we, as we move to identify that learning is a part of a 24-hour ecology, so the students, the young people are learning all the time, when they go home and they play a game, imagine if that same game was incorporated in the school day. The value of it and what it means is, as far as the learning during the school day it's applicable now. It's applicable at home. It's um, applicable when you're playing with your friends. It's an idea that you don't stop learning because you leave the classroom. It becomes real for your life. So if teachers begin to grasp this idea that the standards and the skills are supposed to be for actual living and we push them to really understand that the game isn't contradictory to what they're doing but complementary so it's, it can really help that particular piece and I think everything I've been hearing today shows that we're talking about kind of like getting it on paper putting it down in a way that people can see it and say oh this is how I can use this game to support what I'm doing why not as opposed to I already have reasons why not to and nobody's giving, a re giving me a reason why I can well, we are all examples of why you can do it, so we're forcing the why not question now. And what Daryl just said um, just made me think of something. When we were doing this, my program is on Saturdays. The work that our teens were doing, I'm getting emails on Wednesdays and Thursdays during the week with just updates on their work, which means, yeah, they're taking this home. This is, this is integrating into their life, and I think any teacher would be happy to know that you give your students something and they're taking it home and they're working on it. It's actually becoming something that they're aware of. And they're sharing it with their parents when we had our end of the year celebration. Their parents are saying how excited they were that not, they saw their child playing a video game, but they didn't realize, oh, they're working on lesson plans. And so what Daryl said is absolutely right. It's getting, it starts to become a part of their life. I agree. I, I agree with what was, um, Julie was saying, um, that we do in the schools, using the guide on the side kind of philosophy is, is the best approach to working with teachers. As a technology integration specialist um, five years ago for my district, uh, that was part of it, just getting the teachers on board and excited about watching the kids learn. Um, to help administrators, we have, um, like currently, under No Child Left Behind and the standards, there is a feeling and each year we're given a pacing chart, what is called a pacing chart. And this is happening in public schools where teachers should be on the same lesson, the same unit, and this, teaching the same thing in every classroom in sixth grade. And that it has been the expectation. And I know that sounds like, how can that be? Um, because students are so different, but that has been the kind of environment that has um, sort of permeated the, the public school system under No Child Left Behind. So I think that as soon as we make this shift and, and open it up to teachers once again and say, here, here is a standard, the Common Core standard, and it asks you to help students to problem solve and to reason, you'll get teachers, many teachers, engaging in video games and other, other things. So I think um, that's a great positive thing and a great step in the in the right direction. Yeah, and so um, adding to that, I, I, I would like to talk about uh, how we can make students' gameplay worthwhile for teachers. And you guys have listed, I mean, your examples are, are you know, um, perfect. But uh, uh, Seth, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about SimCity EDU and that community uh, which is a hub for teachers to create and share SimCity-based lesson plans, and how educators can benefit from that community and, and the value in using it. Well, I think SimCity EDU does a few things for teachers uh, with regard to introducing them to gameplay in the classroom and helping that along. So 
one thing it does is is we've got existing lesson plans up at the site now um, that kind of lower the barrier for our teachers to enter into this and start experimenting. So you don't have to create a lesson plan from scratch. You can go, go and look at what sorts of things that the teachers are doing now, what they've had success with in the past. You can use those lesson plans um, as they exist. Uh, you can modify them to better fit your own needs. So I think that's one starting place. The other feature of SimCity EDU that we've um, made available is a spot for teachers to upload new lesson plans. So as you start experimenting with that, the teacher's feedback and so on. So I think those, those are two things that, that, uh, that are helpful there. Okay, great. So we are, are running out of time and we have a, a bunch of questions. So I'm going to jump to the Q&A portion. Um, so the first question comes from Richard. And he asks, how often do you use SimCity with students? What is the most appropriate use for the game? Oh, I, I think you're muted, Julie. Sorry, there we go. Um, so we use it for a month. It's the month of May, and we confine it to a unit. Um, I think if it was installed on the kids' computers year, you know, with the image in September, they would play it all year, and I would worry a little bit about how much they were playing it. So we chose to try to confine it to just one unit. I would say about the same. About one month, um, we use it. And I plan on expanding that this year. I originally intended on us using it for two weeks, um, but we saw how engaged our students were that it ended up going into really five weeks um, because they really took hold of what they were doing. And we saw that they were interested in it. We just kind of let it go, and we were happy with the results. Great. So the next question comes from Maria. Um, she says, I do agree in that games are a closer reflection of today's children's world and that we do need to bring games into the classroom. However, even, most recent re even the most recent research has shown that reading is a stronger uh, quote-unquote brain builder than playing video games. Any comments on that? Are we developing brains less fully by increasing the load on video games and decreasing reading time, for example? I'm really happy for that question. Um, can I suggest a response? Yep. So I, you know, one of the things we're trying to do here at Glass Lab is um, where we can um, to get kids to work in multiple modalities. So we don't think it's enough for students simply to read. We don't think it's enough for them simply to write. Um, we want them doing all those activities. So you know, read, reading the content, writing out ideas, engaged in active discourse, which was a thing that we heard from other folks today, um, all the while. Um, having those activities take place around the gameplay and within the gameplay. So that's one thing. I don't think anyone's saying that video games would replace any, any one of those core activities. Um, and then also, I think the other piece of that is that suggesting that we're having kids work across all those modalities plus the video game playing. Um, and then a, a, another aspect of that is I think we've got a chance here now to start looking at video games as changing the economy in the classroom. And I guess what I'm getting at at that is is that um, the reading now and the writing and the discourse can actually be a chance for um, resourcing kids, having kids see those parts of the classroom activity as giving them the skills and uh, the different um, strengths they need to do better in the gameplay. So all of a sudden you're taking something that they're very interested in already and you're using the classroom experience to drive that even further. And I just want to build on what Seth said, it's not a replacement of reading. And I think that's one of the resistance we get in the, in the classroom and with the school days that video, game is somehow, video games are somehow meant to replace part of the core instruction. And I always imagined it as an enhancement or a complement to as opposed to a replacement of. So I love how the question was worded um, about, you know, you know, replacing reading time or decreasing reading time for video games. I would imagine that if they're really diving into SimCity, that there should be almost an increase in the amount of time of sort of 
reading, research, and the sort of critical thinking involved to be successful in that gameplay. Yeah, that's a really good point, Daryl. I mean, maybe it's worth kind of drawing the distinction between um, learning to read and reading to learn. And where a lot of schooling you know, takes place is with a focus on learning to read, as opposed right. to finding out what kids are interested in, looking at where their engagement lies, and giving them the materials that, that fit with those interests. In that case, you're really reading to learn, and that seems like a win-win across the board. Right. And my hope also would be to just integrate the reading with the software, because you can take SimCity and, for example, the Common Core, once again, I keep referring to that because that's what we're dealing with, um, ask teachers to use more non-fictional text, which really complements something like a SimCity if you have students be reading text on energy or on sustainability or on um, eco-friendly ways for the environment to sustain the environment. So all these things, if you integrate it within SimCity, I think reading could become even an integral part of implementation. Great. Thanks, guys. So the next question is from Caroline. And she asks, how are you using SimCity's multiplayer feature with your kids? The teens in my program actually took the lead on that. They looked at it as an opportunity since they only work together on Saturdays to be able to communicate with each other during the week. It also, um, for, uh, from what I can see, it was a collaborative uh, effort. If somebody had a city that they were working on and their resources started to, uh, to deplenish, they could connect with another teen in the program and say, hey, I need something here, or they can speak with each other during the week, and they can guide them through that lesson plan so they would continue to work. That's why we were able to get those emails during the week because they were able to talk to each other through SimCity, online, and continue their work through the week. And when they get back on Saturday, we were ready to go. We didn't have a lot of catch-up time. Anyone else? OK, so um, the next question is from Jim. And he asks, was it difficult getting your class up to speed on how to play the game? I think he means SimCity, the, the new version, probably. Well, like I said, we really created templates and tip sheets because it's the summer. We understand they have a choice. And we want them to go ahead and be able to level up. So we're trying to provide lots of resources and support to aid them in that endeavor. But it's fun. At the end of the day, I know that's not a word we always like to use <laughs> when we talk about learning, but it's fun. So the idea is if we can help them over the barriers, um, the bumps in the road, then the sort of gameplay itself kind of takes its own life. Um, it's the little things in getting started, which is why all of our templates, at least for what we're doing, kind of guide them in the initial layout of their neighborhoods. And then from there, and we'll see, as time will tell, because we're in the midst of it right now, but, but I believe that it will allow them to run, a, run with the play, just go with it. You know, I can say in, in pilot tests that we've been doing here um, in cl local classrooms, so, you know, we're talking San Francisco, Oakland, and so on, we found that it takes about uh, at least a class session, sometimes a session and a half or so, before kids really start feeling comfortable with all the tools, the maps, the information sources, and all of that. Um, but once they're there, um, they really, I mean, they pick it up quickly, and, and they're very fluid with it. Um, but as, as Daryl said, you know, even though you've got that initial investment in time and energy, kids are really focused, working hard. I mean, we're talking 90 minutes of real concentration, um, and they're very willing to do it. And, you know, the, the sort of knock-on sort of skills they're getting along the way are, I think, are, are significant. So if you have a chance to look at the new SimCity, the maps, uh, the data representations, the graphs, it's really data-rich. And so by no means is it wasted time as kids get, get up to speed on the game. Really quickly, Julie said something earlier I thought was very, very important. 
just allow time in for the kids to play, even if it's just one session, if it's just an hour, just give them time to play. There's nothing wrong with that. And then when you get ready to go on everything, they kind of have a handle of it. That play time is really important. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, we are out of time. I want to thank you all for, for joining us today and, and participating. This was a really, really wonderful webinar. Um, join us for the next episode of Playtime Online, Wednesday, July 24th, as Institute of Play unveils its brand new video exemplar series. For updates on Playtime, sign up for our mailing list. Just click the Join Us at the top of this page. Thanks for watching, everyone. And if you like what we're doing, please spread the word. Have a great evening. Bye, guys. <laughs>